Well, here we are, Antonio, in the sunken garden, uh, enjoying the, 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 the wonderful views. And I, I guess this was where we met two years ago as part of a gardens tour where uh, I was leading a party around and it would have included the sunken garden and all the other areas of the garden. And of course, at one point, we, we paused within what is known uh, as part of Wilmer's, Professor Wilmer's original plans as the Tunnel of Gloom, which is just situ situated over there to our right. And in the Tunnel of Gloom, I guess I, I was explaining how that as part of the forthcoming development of the Garden River Cafe, there was going to be a road that was coming in, that was going to be put in and running down the length of the, the fellow's garden. And what did you, what did you tell me at that point? I, I, I was completely aghast. I thought that uh, you couldn't fell these box trees three of them which had like I think this diameter or something like that which is incredible I've never seen them that thick but why but why box what's so special about box trees box trees a box wood is the only wood you can use for end grain engravings this is um, what is an art form that was founded in the late 18th century and almost died out again like around 100 years later because all of the boxwood was felt so um, boxwood has this unique property it is so dense and so you're densely packed and so soft that you can um, that you can make lines almost etch as um, as thin as copper etchings. So it's a very different from a normal woodcut where you would have al almost these characteristic thick lines. And in um, end grain engravings, you can make uh, yeah very detailed drawings. But, but these these the damage of these trees is very narrow. But you're telling me they were they're literally hundreds of years old, and and so the annual tree rings now, of course. I'm a plant ecologist, so I'm interested in tree rings because I'm in, they're the remnants of the water conducting system. But each of those tree rings so densely packed together because the trees are so old. Yes. And that's what gives you that intensity of the wood that allows you to do the engraving. Exactly, yes. And uh, you remember then I said that you, what you wanted to do with the wood because just having one piece of wood this size is a fortune. So um, having such a treasure lying around <laughs> Well, yes, I did. I did make a, a rather rash promise that I would try to do my best to ensure that. Well, first of all, we we we. Well, first of all, that I would recover any boxwood that was cut. Yes. And then so. the second point I made was very much that we also needed to protect some of the trees in order to. So actually, the um, the, we, the on behalf of the gardens committee, we actually encouraged the the builders the whole process to move the. The, uh, the roadway to the south and protect some of the trees. And we'll be able to see one of those trees that we actually protected. Yeah. And then in the meantime, some of the other box trees that were in the line of the, of, the, of the roadway were felled. I came in late one night and took up the sections and put them in the car and took them home. Yes, I remember it was just during, I think just when the lockdown started, you sent me this picture of boxwood saved. Yeah. And then the tr uh, entire back of the car filled with with tree trunk. Yes, yes. So I, I took them home and just and we and I thought I just needed to treat the ends of the wood to encourage them to dry out to prevent them splitting. But little did I know that boxwood characteristically splits. Yes, it does. So so what we've been left with now are a set of chunks of wood that I've been uh, in my sort of garage with my limited access to woodworking tools, because I'm a relatively recent uh, comer to woodworking. I've been trying to uh, cut into slices and then plane and sand and then hand them on to you uh, uh, for your, for your, well, what, what do you do? How do you make the, the yeah, so where do you start? Well, you, well, you start off with a, with a drawing. So um, my idea was since we had this wood coming from Clare Garden and Clare College and Clare Garden are just, uh, well, beautiful to draw and sketch. Uh, my idea was to uh, make a series on Clare College. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So making um, 12 different blocks um, which capture um, either um, architecture or interior or small details in wood carving or, um, or um, stone carvings, as well as interiors or flowers in the gardens. And then taking all of these drawings and um, well, choosing 12 of those and transforming them, uh, transferring them onto the blocks and then um, start carving them. So for that you need a very specific, well, first you have to, well, you have to cut the block in a plane and then you have to sand it as what you, you did mm -hmm. beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you have to, um, you would start um, cutting them. With well, hang on though, but, 
but you do a drawing, right? Which yes. you've got your sketchbook, and you, maybe yeah. you can you show me some of the, the you've got some of these wonderful sketches that you start out yeah. with, and so then you you copy that sketch onto the wood block, but that that won't come out. I mean, I've learned this now. That won't come out the right way around. So, how do you transfer your sketch onto the wood block? Yes, yeah, so no, it, it doesn't come out. So it is, everything is mirrored. So you would have to, um, y you, when, I, so when I sketch it, it's of course the right way around. And then when I, when I transfer it to the block, so I would sketch the same sketch on the block, but I would have to invert it in my head and have it mirrored onto the block. But then, but then I'm also, don't you have then to work out that the ink part needs to be, isn't the part that you carve? So how do you work out the, to where to cut relative to the lines that you draw that give us a particular architectural feature so so it's well I mean there are two different kinds of wood cutting uh, wood cutting and also engraving either you make it as an inverted so there are often there are of there are quite a lot of um, expressionist um, woodcuts where you would where they actually are negatives right so the lines are where it would be white so that's that is one way to do it and the other way what to do is, is you sketch onto the block and then you leave the sketched part free so you would not you would not make one carving you will make two carvings right next to each other and thereby make a line in the middle of these two right I see right oh, absolutely fascinating and and hopefully we'll be able to see how you've yes. done that when we yeah. go back inside fantastic Okay, so we were having a conversation here in the in the tunnel of gloom, where you explain the importance of these boxwoods, and and then you you you, you also explain that actually you're a full member of Clare, you're a, a postgraduate student registered with Clare. So, what was your interest? And you're a scientist, developmental biologist. Yeah, so I'm, well, I'm I'm having two lives. <laughs> I'm um, doing well, focusing on early embryonic development of uh, mouse and human embryos uh, during daytime and a lot of night hours because of the developmental staging. There are a lot of night shifts involved, and um, um, on the other half of my life, I'm doing art. Which, well, I, when I graduated from high school, I was thinking of going to fine art school or to um, do science and in the end I went for science because my idea was I usually have my best ideas during night <laughs> so um, what should I do with the entire day and I could always do art in the night next to science but you cannot do a professional science career next to art if you are fully into art so I decided to um, do the art on the so, side. So you're a, you're a full-time scientist working all the hours that you have to in the lab and then exactly. in your sort of downtime or when you make time come here so you you then so you didn't really need to ask permission to come into the gardens to to, to, to make your initial drawings no, I because of course you are here as of right exactly so, so I already when we had when we spoke I already did some drawings um, so I um, well I started off with flowers just from the can you see that? yeah sure um, so just from the gardens then this is the sunken garden we are sitting in right now actually and then another one where we have the flowers. So, up, the so tree. these are views of the the, the fastidiate yews that we have, and then the very old apple trees. And of course, these exactly. apple trees are remnants of what we think was the original kitchen garden that would have been here before Professor Wilmer brought about this design of the sunken garden in the late 1940s and so on. So probably these two uh, Bramley trees are the, the, the remnants of what would have been an original garden. And they taste amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's always in summer. So yeah, and then, um, so I did already quite a few sketches actually um, of the different um, flowers, which I then thought, okay, I could transfer some of the flowers onto boxwood as well as the garden architecture. And then, so I made a point of trying to draw every single flower in this garden. Mm. And this is uh, what is right behind us. So we are sitting here right now. Yeah, sorry, okay. here. Sure. And um, yeah, this, is, this has been felled. Well, this, is, well, this tree has been saved and the street is now going through here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then the bridge. Ah, no. the so this is bridge. the bridge and this, we'll maybe see some of these views later, but the, it, it's quite interesting that on the north side of the bridge, the actual carvings haven't been weathered nearly as badly as they have on the side that everybody sees from the scholar's garden. Yeah, exactly. I, I found it very really interesting as well. I tried once to draw from, I tried first from the other side and there I thought I couldn't see anything of the uh, stone carving, but here you can. 
so yeah, this one, and then this is uh, this is soon to become the Riverside Cafe, I think. Oh, brilliant! Um, and this is also the image of our of the first block that I've done, where you have to imagine that um, to carve it, you actually will have to invert everything on on the block. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, you will then have it the wrong way around okay. when you start. So you're, you're going to you're going to have to come back when the River Cafe is finished and, and do, draw us another one of the the latest view. Probably yes. <laughs> yeah, and then I did some. Well, some details on, on the um, on the stones, and here another one of the sunken garden. This is the current uh, senior common room. Oh, that's it's right, the, that's the circle, it's the circle room. room, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then here I started with the gate. I haven't finished because I had to, it started raining, so I had to All stop right. and run away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then um, yeah, this is actually um, part of the um, wood uh, um, wood carving work in the chapel. Okay, now that's all that we've already got a, some images of that that you've now yes. converted actually into your your prints. Exactly. Brilliant. Yeah. Right. And then these are the two beautiful yew trees. All right. We just cut back. This is going to be my next print, I think, or this one. I'm not sure which one of the two. And yeah, this one has just been started to be converted onto a block. Ah, now so that's the view from the scholar's garden into uh, old court. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Brilliant. Excellent. Right. Well, that's that's amazing insights into how you how you start out, and and it just I'm always just so amazed in the way that you you take these sketches and then you produce what are these absolutely fabulous prints that hopefully we'll be able to see in a moment when we uh, when we when we uh, when we look at the, the actual process of print production, which is uh, in itself remarkable. <laughs> so here you are, and Antonia. I mean. What, what I did was, having taken these branches home and they've dried for, well, nearly a year, um, I then, I've got a bandsaw, so I was able to cut slices out of each, out of a, a single branch. Unfortunately, uh, they've cracked, as you can see, during the drying process. But nonetheless, having cut slices through, I've then uh, got an electric plane, so I've then tried to plane them. And then I've got a band sander, which sands them. And then I've got a hand sander to try to get the fine finish. So um, they are, uh, I tried to make them as, as parallel as possible, but unfortunately I'm not that brilliant at these sorts of things. And then uh, on top of that, of course, you've now got the challenge of trying to incorporate this, this crack into each of your images. So really, I've, it's a bit of, <laughs> I've given you quite a challenge, even though you, you're, you seem to be very pleased with the, uh, the, the material, the opportunity to work on it, but over to you <laughs> and Thank let's see you. how you can deal with that. <laughs> so first of all, it's remarkably soft. It's um, very silky. And um, so what we're doing now is that I would choose one of the one of my sketches and then and then start transferring this onto the block so you would make you would make a pencil drawing onto the block showing more or less the um, the image that you want to do. Okay, so that's that's absolutely brilliant. But but when you're doing this is fine for a flower. But when you're doing architectural, don't you have to flip the yes, image? Yes, exactly. So in the moment that um, I'm doing either architectural or interiors, I will have to um, invert the image that I've drawn in my head to have it mirrored onto the block in order to then allow it to be the right way around again when I print it. So as I've done on this block, so um, I'll just turn it. Um, this one is um, just, well, I, I've just started this one, which is um, coming from the archway that leads into ah, the yes. court, yes, yes. as you can see here. Yeah. So you, um, I've, I've done sketches onto it and then um, started carving and if you look at it into um, in, in the light um, if you angle it a little bit you can see actually the, the river there sure and yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. you would then see what you asked beforehand that um, i've done actually each time two lines next to each other so that ah, I would have yes. one black line yeah, yeah. in the middle so this is more or less how far as far as i can go more or less carving blind um, 
and then I would now ink up the block to um, see whether all of these lines are okay. deep enough in order to um, see them and um, then would start adding the details. Okay, right. So then you go back and start to recarve exactly. So in the additional in sort of traits into the exactly. Image. So for example, the different shading areas um, uh, of it. So right now I have just the, I have the big lines. So I'm, I'm I'm having the columns and I have the different stones, but I have to of course add the coloring and shading to the different to the different stones, so you can see that they are m more deep into it or that you're walking through the um, through the archway. Okay, so the first thing that I need to do now is to ink up the roller. So for that, I would, um, I'm, I'm going to use a little bit of um, this Relief ink, which is oil-based. That means that it's going to need a few days to dry. And then I'm inking up. So you cannot only go into one direction, you have to go into two in order to have ink over the entire roller and in an even way. And then once it's inked up, you then uh, and then start to um, ink up the block carefully, and you will see now more or less magically the image appearing that you've seen before and only as a relief. And I have to go a little bit in turns because the block is a bit uneven. But here. And then there it is. So now we see that we have all of the main lines. And now um, I want to start putting in some of the details. So um, I'm now starting to add a bit of detail. For this, I'm using this um, very sharp um, tool, which is almost like a knife. And um, you hold it in the palm of your hand like this, and then you stabilize it with your thumb and your index finger. And then you grab <laughs> the um, the block to stabilize it, and then um, and then I start making um, very fine lines. The interesting thing with any sort of print technique is that you can't make a mistake. Well, well, you must not make a mistake because the block is unforgiving. Once an indentation is in there, you will never get it out. So there are some techniques to rescue the block, but um, they are very time consuming and only possible for a very few uh, flaws that you have. So now um, I'm just trying to get rid of every single piece of it. So you can see now this is now um, lighter than the rest because I've put on these marks. So I do the same kind of marks on this side here to show. So the same is that kind of um, and again, and you see now these two are now evenly light. And then you would, and then I'll start probably with the um, with the columns to make um, to make it visible that they're round, and then I slowly have to work into um, from the light towards the dark because this is going to be very dark because it's the archway through. Wood engraving tools are um, designed in a way that you can put them in the palm of your hand, and then um, you want to make well they are very sharp, so you do not want to have um, any of your fingers in the way. Um, meaning that you will put the tool into the back of your hand and then stabilize it with your um, thumb and your index finger and then you would make such a movement along the, very much onto the surface of the block um, so you don't never want to dig in you will just carve it slowly and engrave it like you have a very tiny line out of it there are two different kinds of tools that I have one is um, a so-called u-shaped um, block so it's it's um, well it's, it's, it's not um, sharp on this side, it's just sharp up here. So, in that way, you will make thick lines like the one you can see here. 
this is from that tool and then I have um, a second one this has a V shape and it is sharp on that surface and on that one so it's very very um, pointy and for, and this you use in exactly the same way you can hold it like this and then moving it across across the surface like that in a very um, very low angle motion like that and um, thereby you make the, sh the fine lines which you can see up here all of these very thin ones and um, to make sure that these tools stay sharp because as we said before the um, boxwood is an extremely hard wood you have to sharpen them for that you will actually use a proper stone <laughs> and um, in case of the v-shaped tool you will move it across like this on both sides in order to get the V shape in place again. And you will have to do this um, usually, if, if you have a big block, you would have to do it twice per block, otherwise, you will do it once before you start cutting block. So you would do this like that. And it's markedly uh, sharper. And then for the V shape, which is again, it's, it's not pointy on this side, it's just pointy here, you have to move it like this. Okay, so um, in order to then to print the actual edition, um, I will, of course, uh, well, I need to, uh, the paper to be a specific size. Um, paper for relief print making comes in very big sheets, as you can see here, which is a mold made paper. So it's actually not paper, but from cotton fibers. Um, in order, and you, you don't tear this, uh, you don't cut the paper, you tear it. So for that, you will. Bend it over, like that. And then you take a so-called bone and enforce this side. meaning that you get uh, eight pieces of paper, so eight prints out of one big sheet. And the nice thing with this kind of cotton paper, or cotton-based paper, is that it doesn't get yellow on the edges, but rather stays this way. Um, mold made paper has two different sides um, because it's actually lying down on a very um, fine grid net when it sits down. So um, you don't want that side to um, be the side you print on, you want to print on the other side. So just before printing you have to check that you're actually going to print on the right side because the back side where it was lying on this net um, is not going to take up the ink as nicely as the front. And if you look closely, you will still see these, the small grid from the net, so also not ideal. Yeah, and this should be done either on a glass table or on a surface to protect the wood because you see here all these lines that I'm making. That I'm, that this is, I'm exerting quite a bit of force and otherwise you will have a lot of indentations in the table itself. So 
So now we can start with printing. So this is um, now a, well, the, a sketch of the um, of the garden that is going to become the Riverside Cafe, and you can see here again it is the other it's um, inverted. So um, in the end, um, this edge is going to be on the other side. So um, you will see again here these lines that are very thick. So they've been done with a U-shaped um, tool, and then all those very thin lines to make put all in all the detail. They've been done with the V-shaped tool. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to ink it up. So again, I have to ink up the I have to ink up the roller first. I always have to you always have to go in 90 angle, 90 degree angle. So to allow the roller to be inked up evenly. If I only go on one side, then I have more ink on one side than on the other, and thereby um, I would ink up the block unevenly. So when I start. Go again. And it's really since the block is not completely even, um, it's because it's not industrial cut but hand cut. You have to make sure that it really is reflecting everywhere because the ink is a bit wet, so you can see it reflecting. This is why I have to hold it up. And then, um, normally, um, wood engravings are printed with letter presses or these old Gutenberg style presses that um, would just go down and you would have to tilt, um, well, pull it over. But um, um, we don't have one of these presses here so we're doing it by hand. Um, so I'm using one. Of, I'm using the bone that I used before to, to tear the paper I'm going to use to apply the force um, enough to be able to, add, to get the, transfer the ink to the paper. So as I explained beforehand, we have two different sides of this mold made paper, so I have to take the right side. And the best indicator is the edge, which is on one side is going to have a very sharp line and on the other one um, a very fine, uh, well, uh, less sharp line. So I want, to I want to take the side that is less sharp, so it's going to be this side. Um, I'm then angling the paper on top because I want to have it um, I want to have even space on both on either of the two sides, and then I'm closely putting it on top, put it down, hold it in the middle so it doesn't move anymore, and then I start applying the pressure. And if it's done rightly, you will see a little bit of the block coming through um, the paper, so you can see some lines, and then I know that I've applied enough force. And so here, when I'm going over these um, very thick lines, I can hear it, so I'm, I know that I'm doing it the right way. And you have to be very careful with the crack because then you have it, you're applying a lot of pressure but um, then there wouldn't be any wood block anymore so the paper will, will tear if I'm um, applying the same amount of force so I have to be a bit more careful on the bottom which is why I'm having it on the tissue so I can roll it uh, I can move it back and forth And then, when it's done, I can see all as the entire block is through the paper. I will lift it off and then have the print. And then this print needs um, around two to three days to dry because the ink is oil-based. So um, I would then do the next print. You have an, addi an addition of 50 prints, so each block is going to be printed 50 times, and then um, the block must be destroyed, and thereby we, would ha we have the value of the addition. 
because it can't be reproduced anymore. You have 50 originals. So first, for the second print, I have to ink up the block a bit more. Yeah, so um, I'm inking up the block again. For this, I first uh, used a bit more ink. So I have to um, even this out. Again, to have even distribution of ink on the roller so that I don't ink up one side of the block alone. And then again. Um, again, I have the block on the tissue so that I can slide it back and forth. And because the block isn't perfectly even, I have to go from different angles. In a classical letterpress setting, I would just go over at once and then it would be done. So again, I hold it against the light to make sure that everything is inked up and you can see it reflect. Once I'm sure that everything is inked up, I will take the paper and again make sure I'm taking the right side. So this one is easy because it has the actual watermark of the paper maker down here. So this is supposed to be on the back side. And then, then again, moving it, putting it down, holding it down to make sure that the paper doesn't move, and then I start applying force. And also, if I go over the edge too fast, I would also tear the paper. So I have to angle the bone a little bit when I go along here. But at the same time, I want the edge, of course, to be printed perfectly. So I still have to make sure that it's all there. And then, yes. So we have now 50 prints plus uh, artist proofs, which um, are kept um, well, as an archiving tool if all of the prints are sold. So I have one myself, <laughs> and um, which are unsellable. And um, once the edition is done, the block has to be destroyed to make sure that it can, can never be reproduced. And thereby you have... 50 originals of this uh, of this image and um, no well, no block to reproduce it so you have this is why an edition has its value you have 50 blocks uh, sorry, 50 prints and that means that um, so it's it's there 50 times and that's it after that the block was destroyed and um, since you don't have the mold you can't do it again and um, yeah so here we have this is now block number 50, so... Um, as soon as this is done, so it's... It, it, you don't... Not, you don't... Well, I don't have to completely destroy the block. I just have to make sure that I can't print again the same print. So I can just make a mark um, into it. Which is what is quite common, especially for boxwood blocks, as they are so precious, is to sand them down again and just reuse it. And thereby you can use one block multiple times. Okay, so I'm, for this I'm going to take the um, U-shape tool. I'm going to put my initials, so an AW, but mirror-sided in. So... So 
so in that right now, of course, the block can't be printed again. Okay, so um, as I explained before when I was showing how to cut, um, wood is unforgiving, so you can't make a mistake, or if you make one, it has to be a very small one so you'd be able to fix it, because you would have to fix it on every single print, and because you can't, if you chopped away a wood, piece of wood, you can't build it back in, you will have to then put the put the ink on the print itself, so on the paper. So as you can see here, this line, um, which is just in the end while, when I was um, carving, um, when I was engraving, um, the tool slipped and I went through the part of Clear College up here. <laughs> so um, in order to fix this, I will um, use um, the printing ink and then have to fix it on every single print itself. So what I'm going to do is I will very carefully reconstruct these lines here in between. So here, here, and then also these very thin ones here to then have this um, line disappear. Okay, so um, as I explained uh, from uh, just now, this flaw has to be fixed. So um, here you see that there is no line, because I've already fixed it on this one. And then here you will see there is one. So what I need to do is to very carefully construct these lines here to um, get rid of this arrow in the in the print. So this, I'm using a very sharp pencil. Actually, you can use any sort of very pointy object. So the nice thing is here that I would, if I if I put in the, if I put the pencil into this um, piece of ink and then pull it up, I will have um, it dripping down. So I can use this because it's very thin and actually lay it into the flaw in the in the block. I learned this kind of relief printing from a copper etcher in Vancouver, who. Um, showed me this trick when I was when I did my first mi big mistake in a block and I was very upset and thought I would have to destroy the entire plate. Then he sat me down and showed me how to do this and thereby saved the block. So then this one is fixed. Yes, I've been doing art more or less my entire life. <laughs> um, into printing, I, I got into it while I was um, doing my um, grade 11 in high school abroad in Canada. And um, I had a fantastic art teacher who encouraged me to take art classes at the um, Emily Carr University of Fine Arts in Vancouver in my spare time, <laughs> which I did. Um, the Emily Carr University is on a small island in, close to downtown Vancouver. Um, and the entire Granville Island, it's called, and the entire island is um, full with um, studios of different artists. So I met a lot of them. I did. Um, I, I learned how to do glass blowing and um, and did a lot of uh, drawing classes. And then I also met uh, Peter, who is a copper etcher. Peter Braune, who um, runs a copper etching studio there, and he um, he showed me a few. He, I well, I was more or less just hanging around in the studio. I was uh, seventeen years old, and just more or less being there the entire time <laughs> and watching him print for um, artists um, um, from all over the world who came there. And um, then I went back, actually, just before I did my master thesis, I did a, um, I did a um, three months placement at the Cancer, Re Cancer Research Center in Vancouver, um, for, just before I did my master thesis and then started my PhD here. And um, so, um, yeah, I just walked back into his, into his studio and asked him whether... Um, 
well, A, whether he remembered me, and then um, B, whether we could do something uh, cool together. And he was up to it. And then I spent these three months, I spent the day in the lab and the evening hours in his studio and um, did and got then really, well, learned how to do professional copper etching and um, printing techniques. And also then learning how to more or less, um, well, more or less learning all of these tricks that I'm doing here right now plus um, learning how to print without a studio because I don't have one of course I'm here you see I'm printing by hand instead of with a proper press so um, we more or less went through all of the different things you can do so they will now have to print to dry for three days and the last step will be to sign them Print editions, oh well, I don't know about photography, but not print editions, so copper etchings or um, dino cuts or screen prints are usually um, signed by with pencil. And there's a very specific system, so um, you put the number on the left side, then the name of the print in the middle, and then your signature on that side. So you always have this three system. So this one is going to be 150. Then I'm signing on, the, on that side. So this would then be 150. And you will also have to put in the date. And well, if not the date, then at least the year under the name of the artist. And that's it.